So we are going to get into the word this morning. I'm so happy to have you guys. If you are new here and you don't know who I am, my name is Pastor Dante. I am the senior pastor here, currently have been for the last year. Uh, and we will see if that will continue after July 14th when we have a vote. So, uh, but we are excited to be here. Me and my wife are excited to be uh, pastors. Sorry, I got a new mic and it don't like to, it don't want to form to my head. So it's like popping off over here. Uh, but we will make do, all right? So this is what we do. Uh, we, we have been about four, four things here uh, since, since I started on as senior pastor. And I haven't said it in a few weeks, but there's four very, very important things. And it really, it's not just things that we're about. It's really the journey that God wants us to go on as believers. And the first one is we want you to know God, Amen. right? It, it's not enough just to go to church and sit in the chair and go home. Uh, that God has a relationship in store for us that he wants us to be a part of. He don't want to just know of us. He wants to know us. And he don't want us just to know of him. He wants us to know him personally, intimately, right? So we want you to know God. We want you to discover, to discover your identity because every single person under the sound of my voice has an identity in Christ. You have one that was given to you by the world, one that was given to you by bullies, one that was given to you by people that don't like you and parents that thought less of you, but there is a real identity that comes through Jesus Christ that changes all of that. Amen? Amen. The third thing is we want you, we want you to discover your purpose because every single person was born with one. If you are breathing, everybody inhale, exhale, you have purpose, amen? And the fourth one and final one is we want you to use all of that stuff to make an impact on this world because light always impacts darkness, right? Uh, salt always impacts your steak. If you go to eat a steak and it doesn't have any salt on it, you know. You put some salt on it, you know, right? Because we are a light to the dark world, and we are salt in this earth, amen? So we're a light and we're salt. So we want you to make an impact in this world. Now, we always do this uh, before, before I begin to preach, and we just grab your Bible, if you have a paper Bible, uh, a Bible app if it's on your phone or an iPad or tablet or whatever you, whatever you have, and you hold it up like this, and you guys are going to have to pay attention because God put something else on my heart, and hopefully I get it right. So, and you just repeat this after me. This is my Bible. Is my Bible. It, is God's it is God's word. It is truth. It is, truth. It is, life. It is life. It is power. It is power. And it is, it is for me. So today, so today I, will I will be equipped to defeat hell, to, defeat hell, to, raise, the dead, to raise the dead, and make an impact in this world for the, for, the for the kingdom of God. Amen. 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 All right, let's get into it. So I'm so happy about this. This uh, next, and I, I actually didn't get that all right, but we'll, we'll critique it as we move forward. We'll tweak it. Um, but I've, I've been wanting to do this particular message series for a while, and it's based upon a book by John Bevere. Does anybody know who John Bevere is? You read any of his stuff? Oh, my gosh, this mic. Um, I've gone through one of the most impactful uh, books that I ever read for me was one that he did called Driven by Eternity. And, and I read that he talks about eternal rewards and judgment. Uh, when, we, when we look at God, when we look at the Bible, it's so easy for us, for a lot of people, especially if they don't know him, to think of him as a, as a judging God. But really, we have to look at him as a rewarding God. Uh, Hebrews says this. It says that if you are to come to him, that you must first believe a couple things. You must first believe that what? That he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him, right? So if we are even going to come to God, we can't come to him thinking that he's just a judging God. We have to come to him knowing that he is a rewarding God. That he has gifts and rewards for us here on this earth. And so honor's reward is what, this, what our series is going to be about for the next few weeks. Uh, we are going to do two weeks. Um, and then on June, or July 19th, we have uh, Brother Ken Cowan. Evangelist Ken Cowan, I don't know what, I think it's Evangelist Ken Cowan that's going to be in the building, and I want to see him do his old Pentecostal leg kick thing that he used to do back in the day. We haven't had him here in a while, so I'm excited to have him in the house, and so we get to receive an evangelist, right? And, and so when, we, when we're going through this over the, this week and next week, especially this week, I just want to lay groundwork. Um, so we won't really get into the reward part of it as much, but we're going to lay some groundwork today. Are y'all ready? Yeah. About five people. Are y'all ready? Yeah. All right. 
All right, so um, first thing I want to tell you is this. When, when we are in ourselves, before we know who Jesus Christ is, before we know who he is, before we make the decision to live for him, uh, we are governed by our flesh. And you can write this down if you take notes. Um, you may want to, you want to write this down. You want to write this down. Type it in, your notes, something, believe me. Um, before we come to know him, or even as Christians that are not acting on the spirit, but we're acting in ourselves, we are governed by our flesh. All right? So our flesh governs three areas. It governs what we think, what we say, and what we do. You got that? Our flesh governs three areas, what we think, what we say, and what we do. Just a couple scriptures just to back up. So back up what I'm talking about. So on what we, what we think, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 5, it says this. It says, those who live according to the flesh set their minds where? It sets their minds on things of the flesh. So if you are in the flesh, where are you thinking? In the flesh. So if somebody cusses you out in the flesh, you're going to what? You're not going to be like, oh, bless you in the name of Jesus. No, what you're going to do in the flesh is you're going to turn around. You're going to cuss them out too. Why? Because I can do that because I'm in my flesh. So my mind, because I'm in the flesh, is set on things of the flesh. Um, on what we say in Matthew 12, 34, the scripture that we often use, and it, it says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When Jesus is using this, he isn't talking about your faith. When Jesus is talking about this, he's talking about people and the blasphemous things that they were saying about him. And he's like, well, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is speaking. Why? Because my heart is full of me. And I can talk me all day. Right? And the third thing is what we do. Romans chapter uh, 3 uh, one, one part is, is Paul, he's quoting an Old Testament scripture, and he says this about sinners. He says, their feet are swift to shed blood. Their feet are swift to shed blood. You guys ever know, um, everybody knows a sinner, right? Everybody knows somebody that don't know Jesus Christ. Uh, you ever wonder why they are so easily get in trouble? Like, I've got a brother um, <laughs> who just got amazingly blessed uh, because he got in trouble. He, he knows God or knows of God, but he doesn't know God. He's not living for him. We were all raised in the same household, same church, did a lot of the same things. God changed me. He just continued doing what he wanted to do. But <clears throat> he's, he's not much taller than my son, so he's about 5'8". He's always been the shortest one in the family. And what do we say about short people? They have the Napoleon complex, right? They have short stature but big mouths. <laughs> So he always found ways to get himself into trouble. And sometimes he found ways because I was little brother and I wanted to be with big brother. Sometimes I got in trouble because of it as well. Of course, it was my own decision to go through with it, but, you know. But he always found himself in trouble. He would, he would go to the same place I would go to, but somehow he would get into a fight. How is that even possible? Like, I'm around the same people. Nobody wants to beat me up, but it seems like everybody wants to beat you up. Why? Because his feet were swift to shed blood. His feet carried him to trouble. When you live for yourself, you ain't got to work very hard to get in trouble. <laughs> you breathe, and it seems like trouble shows up on your doorstep, right? So that's because we are in our flesh. And so our flesh governs what we think, what we say, and what we do. But when we come into the kingdom, when we come to know God, and we make the decision to live our lives by his standards, by his rule, then we are no longer supposed to be governed by our flesh anymore. We're governed by something different, a whole new set of standards, a whole new set of rules. And the only way, the only way that we can find these rules, the only, the only possible way we can find out how to live according to the kingdom rule is to go to what? This is called the instruction book. What is it called? The B-I-B-L-E? Basic instruction before leaving earth. This is your manual. How do I live according to God's word? Or how, to God's will, to God's kingdom rule? You read his word. He will tell you. He, he listed it for you so that way we can keep track and say, okay, well, I did that one. 
right? I'm not living according now when I made it to change some stuff up. But he wrote it in his word. And so now, because we are in the kingdom, we use the word, the instruction book, to build or to form beliefs. And those beliefs now, she is out. She's having a good old Holy Ghost time over there. And now those beliefs now govern what we think, say, and do. Y'all write that down? We use God's word to build or to strengthen a belief that we already have. It has to be based upon his word because this is kingdom law, kingdom rules. So if I'm living my life according to God's will, then I am going to look to his instruction book on how I'm supposed to live. And when I do that, I will either build or strengthen a belief system. And when I have those beliefs, those beliefs now will supersede or supposed to supersede my flesh to where now my, my beliefs will govern what I think, say, and do. And the reason why this is important is because of what we're going to talk about, this thing of honor. If we cannot understand the fact that we are looking at kingdom rule, when we talk about honor, you will do this. That's not for me. He's just trying to get something out of it. I know I got your game, Pastor. You want to talk about honor so that way we honor you and no? No. Because I'm not talking for my behalf. I'm talking for yours. A pastor's job is two things. What I tell you a couple weeks ago is to lead and to feed. I'm supposed to give you God's word so that you will be fully equipped to do the work of the ministry, to live the life that God has called us to live, to build, strengthen, right? So that's my job. I'm not trying to get anything out of it. Will it benefit us as a church? Absolutely. Will it benefit you in your home? Absolutely. Will it benefit you at work? Most assured it will. So we have to understand we have to get this, this thing that when I'm in the kingdom, the way I talk changes, what I do changes, and the way I think changes. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 through 23, a part of it says, put off the old man, which is the flesh, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. What's that, what does that mean? Simply put, you can write this down if you're a note taker, my thoughts changed because I'm changed. Novel idea, right? My thoughts change because I've been changed. Amen. Psalm, the second one on what we say, Psalm um, 1914. It says, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Old Testament scripture. Amen. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable. Simply put, I talk different because my heart is different. I talk different because my heart's different. So there should never be a Christian that if somebody cusses you out, you turn around and cuss them out. Well, God knows my heart. I deleted a Facebook page because of that. I did. I've got one now, but I used to have one that was Dante Cobb back in the day. Uh, I don't remember how many years ago it was, and I had a cousin that was constantly talking about people, how ugly they were, how stupid they were. And then 20 minutes later, she would post scripture. And so I asked her one day, what's up with that? Why do you do that? Well, God knows my heart. I'm like, yeah, but do they? And I was like, and so I kept seeing it, and I kept seeing it for more people. And I was like, you know what? I don't need Facebook. I don't post anything anyway, so bye. Why? Because we are now, we're not being governed by our flesh. We're being governed by kingdom rules. So that means I talk about you or to you differently. Right? Y'all okay out there? I'm not, I'm like, like slapping you or anything. Am I? Okay. So third one on what we do, James chapter 1 verse 22, it simply says what? Be doers of the word and not just hearers only. So if I'm going to believe in this word, then that means I'm supposed to be a doer of the word. I don't, have to, I don't need to make excuses on, on, or find loopholes around God's rules. I'm supposed to do God's rules. 
So when it comes to outreach, I'm not supposed to make excuses on, well, I don't feel led to pray for people. No, God's rule says that if you are a believer, you are supposed to pray for people. I'm supposed to be able to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. I'm supposed to be able to cast out demons. I'm supposed to raise the dead. Like, I'm supposed to be able to do this stuff because Jesus said, greater works I do, will you do, right? So if that's true, then why do I make excuses on why I'm not able to do it? So I don't go for it. I just sit in church on Sunday and be like, woohoo, praise the Lord, amen. Why, when it says that we that we are supposed to worship God with everything that we are. We worship God with everything but who we are. Because ourselves, we don't like the songs, we don't like the singers, we don't like how... Right? So who does it sound like you're being governed by? The flesh. I'll move on because some of y'all... No. Uh-huh. So in this area of honor, when we're talking about this thing of honor and the reason why it's so important, Jean Bavir put it this way. He said that honor is the currency of heaven. Honor is the currency of heaven. We're going to look at Mark chapter 6. Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 6, verse 5. We're going to look at this one scripture, and this one scripture is going to be Well, it's the basis for what we're going to talk about today, but it's going to make very, very clear some things about honor. Mark chapter 6, and this is talking about Jesus. It says, and because of their unbelief, it's New Living Translations, and because of their unbelief, he could do no mighty miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. This scripture is talking about Jesus. Jesus goes into his hometown. We'll read that here in a second. He goes, in, he goes into his hometown. He had been out ministering. He had been raising dead people. He had been opening blinded eyes, deaf ears, lame people getting up walking, you know, all of this stuff, healing lepers and all kinds of crazy stuff and casting out demons. Like, this is what Jesus did on the regular. But then he goes home and it says this, and because of their unbelief, he could do no mighty works there. He couldn't do anything except for lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. So maybe maybe somebody had a headache and Jesus was able to heal the headache. Maybe somebody had a toothache and he was able to heal them. Maybe they stubbed a toe and it was swollen, you know, and he's like, be healed. and And the swelling went away and the toe got healed. But the person that had leprosy that was waiting for him to heal them, they couldn't get healed. The person that had cancer, if because it was there too. Uh, the person that had cancer couldn't get healed. Even though Jesus, the miracle worker, was in the building, something happened to keep him from being able to work a miracle. What was it? Let's go back. Let's go back. We're going to go back a little bit. I wrote something down. I want to make sure I read it because I think it's pretty funny. So, so we're going to go back. I want to read it. Let's go back, because sometimes in order to know where you're at, you got to go back a little bit, right? And this is why I want us to read it. How many of you have ever walked into a room and forgot why you walked in there? And you're like, so what do you do? Oh, you got to go back to remember what you came in there for, right? And that's not an age thing, people. It's not an age thing. Our teenagers will attest. My daughter's like, I do that all the time. I know I've been doing it since I was a teenager. I walk into a room and is like, why did I? I came in here for something. But anyways, so we're going to go back. So go back to the beginning of the chapter, Mark chapter 6. It says, Jesus left, the part, Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. You get that? Many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Stop. So Jesus goes to his hometown. He goes into the synagogue, and he does what Jesus does. He goes and and opens 
the scroll to Isaiah, and he begins reading, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And the people were like, oh my gosh, this is, this is awesome. This is the best sermon ever. I'm so glad I came to synagogue today, right? And Jesus is there, and they're all into it, and they're on the edge of their seats, and they're all like, oh my gosh, this is so awesome. And, and as they were amazed, and where did he get this wisdom? He's so smart. And the power, he hadn't even done anything yet, so I believe that he was telling them testimonies of what he did. They were hearing, man, I, I laid hands on this man that had this legion of demons in every single one of them ran. I laid hands on this young man, and the demon ran off, and it cried with a loud cry. It was crying for its mama. And they're like, oh, my gosh. Or, oh, my Jesus. Oh, MJ. Oh, my Jesus. Where did he get this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Notice, they were amazed first. Next verse. Something changed. Verse 3. Then they scoffed. What? How do you go from amazement to now you're scoffing? Keep going. He's just a carpenter. He's a son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, you know, the bad ones that keep running and tearing up stuff all over the neighborhood. And his sisters live right here among us. Then they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. What happened? What happened to where they were so amazed, so in awe over what he was saying and the stories that he was telling of the miracles that were being done through his hands to where they were now offended and refused to believe in him? What happened? Somebody made the statement that took him from being holy and set apart to make him common. He's sitting there teaching, and they're like, oh, my gosh, this is so awesome. And then somebody nudges and is like, hey, we know you. That's Jesus. You know Mary's son. Oh. The one that says he's the son of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. James and Joseph's brother, little brother, or big brother. You know that, that dude? He's not little brother. He's big brother. Judas and Simon, like all those guys, like this is, we know him and his family. So they made him common. And when they made him common, it says that they got offended and they refused to believe. It didn't say that they, they just flat out refused. Oh, we know him. I ain't believing anything he's got to say. Come here talking about you raising dead people. How often do we do that? I've been in, how many of you have been in church pretty much your whole life? You've heard this story how many times? You've heard sermons like this how many times? And so the minute the pastor stands up and he's like, hey guys, I want you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter, and you're like, I already know what he's going to say. <laughs> this story again. When a joke is told, you're like, man, that's like the fifth time you told that joke this year. Move on. Get some new material. <laughs> I know this one. I know this story. I can tell you without even looking at it. Watch. <laughs> we take the word of God, something that we're supposed to high, hold in high regard, and we make yeah. it common. And when we do that, the power that it holds, it, it's gone. It's not because it's not there. It's because we turned it off for us. And that's what these people ran into. This is Jesus. This is the Messiah in an era where they were looking for the Messiah. This is who he is, and he's sitting in front of them, and he's like, hey, today the scripture is filled in, in, among you. And they are thinking, okay, this is the way the Messiah is going to look. They had their own view of what the Messiah was going to look like. They had their own stipulations on what he was going to do, how he was going to sound, how he was going to dress, you know, how loud he was going to talk or how low he was going to talk. They knew everything. They had it all planned out of this is what my Messiah is going to look like. So when Jesus showed up and he was somebody that they knew, they turned it off. 
I don't like that. I don't like the way that looks, so I'm done. Y'all ought to watch. I, I need to get a camera up here to show y'all what y'all look like from this angle. But this is, this is that Jesus. And then in verse 4, Jesus replies, oh, no, 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 stop. Stop, go back. I'm getting away from my notes. I want to read this word for word, okay? One statement took him from Savior to simple. From Messiah to common to the kid down the street. And this is where many people find themselves today. Whether you've been in church your whole life or when you've been in church your whole life, he becomes familiar. I know that story. I've heard that sermon. I know the jokes. Others try to make him just like us. So now he drinks. Now he gets high. Now he's gay. Now he's black. Now Jesus is white. Now he's a Democrat. Now he's Republican because now he's common. Is that right? Look at Jesus' reply in verse 4. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere. A prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown, among his relatives and his own family. The reason why Jesus couldn't do anything in that town wasn't just because they wouldn't believe, it's because they had no honor. Because he became familiar, because he came common, they lost honor, and there was no honor in their hearts for him. And so he couldn't, and it's not that he wouldn't, he could not do any mighty work. He could not do a miracle. Uh, the Amplified Version says that he, it just says it that way, that he could not do. Put that one up there, Steve. And he was not able to do even one work of power there. One work of power there, except he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. Why? That's Jesus. Honor, gone. The Greek word, so the only thing, let me, let me say this, the only thing that was strong enough to stop the miracle working power of God that was in Jesus Christ, the only thing ever noted to stop the miracle working power of God through Jesus Christ was the issue of honor. So do you think that honor is important? And isn't it so amazing that this is the thing that seems to be lacking so much in our country? Oh, yeah. There is no honor for anybody unless you believe just like I do. And sometimes I still don't even like you. <laughs> the Greek word for honor is this word here. It's to me. To me. It's time for honor. I heard you. It's time. It is time with an accent over the E. So it's to me. And it means this. To me means a valuing. A valuing. It also means weighty or precious. To appreciate, to esteem, to favorably regard and to respect. This is to me. And this is what the people lost. They, they no longer valued Jesus because they remembered who he was. They no longer saw him as something as being precious or they didn't appreciate what he was trying to do. They didn't esteem him or favorably regard him and they lost all respect for him because he became common and familiar. And they went from the point of being, and this always gets me, they went from the point where they were so amazed to where now they were offended. He was still speaking the same words, but now you offend me. Yeah. Wow. 
the antonym for teme is this word, atome. Atome. And it means this, to treat as common or ordinary. To not, not to show respect, to not value. To not show respect, to not value. Atime. So when we look at honor, and as we continue in this series, as we look through honor, honor comes from three different areas. Honor is shown three different ways, and, I, and this is why I wanted you to write this down at the beginning. Honor is shown three different ways. You ready? Honor is shown by what you say or by your word. It's shown by your action, and it's shown by what you think. True honor. True honor is going to be shown in what you say, what you do, and how you think. So isn't it amazing that when we come into the kingdom of God, what God's rule does is it changes the way we think, what we say, and what we do. Because God is not trying to do things based upon this world system. He is a king and he has a kingdom all his own that comes with his own set of rules that we are supposed to live by. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. This is my last scripture that we'll read together. Jeremiah 29, 13, it says this. That's not it. That's not all of it anyways. Verse 12, it says, then you will call upon me and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. That's not the one I was looking for. That's the one he said, but that's not the one I was looking for. Give me a second. Sorry, Isaiah 29, 13. <laughs> They gave you the wrong prophet. You know, they all look alike. I'm joking. (laughs) Isaiah, Jeremiah, it's the ayahs. Um, Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, it says this, the Lord says this, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. These people, he's talking about his people, his chosen people, us. They honor me with their lips. They honor me with their lips, but they have removed their hearts far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the commandments of men. The reason why honor is such an issue is because it's a heart issue. And we know over and over in Scripture, it tells us that God looks at the heart. So what God was saying in this Scripture is that the people have an outward appearance and the sound of honor, but their hearts aren't even in it. They come to church and they look like they believe in me. They act like they believe in me. They say the Christianese things that make them sound like they believe in me, but their heart is not in it. The reason being is because true honor, true honor originates in the heart and is an outflow. And this is a quote from John Bevere. Uh, True honor originates in the heart and is an outflow of the reverential fear of God. When I honor God, I will honor him with my whole heart because I have a reverential fear. I love him, and so I will honor him. So the Jewish people, knowing the prophecies about the Messiah, had an image or an idea of what they thought 
Jesus or the Messiah would look like, act like, sound like. But when he was now in front of them, they withheld honor and even got offended at him because he was too familiar. And we'll see this again in Luke chapter 5, verse 17. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing. We're not going to read all of it. But you can read it. Luke chapter 5 is a story of the paralytic that got lowered down to, through the ceiling. There are some words that I never really caught a hold of the whole time I've read this. But it says that Jesus was, we all know that Jesus was in the house and there were Pharisees and Sadducees and all kinds of people around the house, right? So much so that they couldn't, that the people that were bringing the paralytic, they couldn't get in because the house was full and then it was full around the house. I say this in pretty good meeting, right? But these were leaders that Jesus was talking to. And it says that the power of, the power to heal was present. To heal them. Because there were people that were already there. There were leaders. There were Pharisees, Sadducees. There were church people that were there that needed healing, but they didn't get healed. The only person that walked away healed that day was the, was the paralytic that got lowered down through the ceiling. And the reason being, and you can look it up. The reason being was because some of them. When Jesus, when the man got lowered down, you guys know the story, when the man got lowered down in front of Jesus and Jesus looked at him and said, son, your sins are forgiven. What happened? The leaders, it says that they didn't say anything, but they began to think. Remember, honor. They began to think, who is this that can forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. Who does this man think he is? And it says that Jesus, when he knew their thoughts, looked at them and said, which is easier to say? So the reason why they didn't get healed, the reason why the church people didn't get healed was because they had a lack of honor for the one called Jesus Christ. And I truly believe, and I, and I said this last week, I truly believe that part of the reason why so many churches don't see or don't fulfill the call of God on that church, because we know according to scripture, when a church is planted, God has a plan for that church. And I believe that the reason why so many churches don't see the plan of God come about or manifest in their lifetime is because so many churches have a lack of honor for Jesus Christ. We have a lack of honor for him, so we have a lack of honor for the one that is presenting the word. And we'll see this as we continue. Like I said, I'm, not, I'm just trying to lay groundwork, so I'm trying to, not trying to get in. We'll be here for a while. So we'll, we'll see this that as we continue to walk through that there, there are things, and when it comes to being honor's reward, and the reason why this is called honor's reward, that there, there's scripture that when we see that's based upon the study, based upon what the word says, is that there are rewards that come with certain things. And when it comes to honor and when it comes to certain things according to God's rule, you can receive a, a full reward, a partial reward, or no reward at all. How many of you would want the full reward? Amen. I want the full reward in my life. And so that's why we're going through this because I believe that not, not only will this change our church forever if we grab hold of this, but it will, it will change your house. It will change your work. Even if you're the company owner, it will change your business. Because of this one simple word, honor. Would you stand on your feet? So come back next week. We'll get into part two of this.